I speak to you in the name of God, your Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Just in case any of you are wondering what happened to the torches that usually accompany us, there was a little bit of a mishap just before the service, and uh, one of our torches is a little um, out, of, out of kilter right now. So uh, if any of you are looking for a memorial to give to the church, we are in need of two new torches. We can talk about it after the service. While everyone knows that Handel wrote the music for Messiah, Fewer people could probably name the, the man who wrote the libretto, the text. Anyone? Yes, Charles Jennings. Who was that? Oh, it's Sir Andrew Quiet. That doesn't count. Sir Andrew Quiet. His name was Charles Jennings. He was a wealthy English landowner, a patron of the arts, and a devout Christian. He read widely, and his interests in music and theology came together when Handel asked him to collaborate on an oratorio celebrating the life of Jesus. Now, Handel had made it clear he wanted to focus on the nativity and on the passion, and he didn't want to include a whole lot that happened between. But Jennings insisted on including one event from Jesus' life, that which we celebrate today, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. In the events of Palm Sunday, Jennings saw a clear declaration of Jesus that he was the Messiah, God's anointed one sent to save his people. Jennings was right. Jesus' entrance into the city of Jerusalem is strategically planned to fulfill Jewish prophecy and to make it clear just who he was. But Jesus is also being clear, just, just as clear, about who and what he is not. Because both the Hebrew people and Romans waved palm branches around. Jews used palm branches to celebrate their annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem when they celebrated their salvation by God from the hands of their enemies, especially their release from slavery in Egypt at the time of the Passover, and so they would wave palm branches. But Romans also waved palm branches to celebrate victory in war. And indeed, they had their own triumphal processions. These were granted to military generals who had won a decisive victory over their, over their enemies and in which they had, they had killed at least 5,000 of the enemy. You did that, you were given a triumph. And then you were given a position of power within the government. And as they waved palms, the Romans would also shout praise to their Savior, their Lord, the Son of God, by which they meant the Emperor. All of these were titles that the Romans used in reference to Caesar. But here on this Sunday in Jerusalem, palms and titles like Lord and Son of God are being used for a man who is the complete opposite of the Roman Emperor. Not a military general, but a carpenter turned preacher. A rabbi who taught his followers to love and to pray for their enemies. A man who said those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And while Christians would come to see Jesus as the most powerful being ever to walk the earth, Paul reminds us today in the letter to the Philippians that he did nothing to exploit that power but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, continually submitting himself to the, to the will of God, even though it would lead him to his death. So Jesus is the complete opposite of a Roman triumph. He intentionally sets the idea of the Roman power on its head, entering Jerusalem on a donkey, just as the prophet Zechariah said he would. Because the, because the donkey was an animal of peace. He, did, he intentionally does not enter Jerusalem on a horse, which was the animal of war. Jesus is saying, yes, I am your king, coming to you as the prophet said I would. But despite the fulfillment of prophecy, he will disappoint almost everyone in that crowd, waving their palms, shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. 
because he's not going to save them the way they expect, the way they want. The word Hosanna, which we use every, every Sunday in the Eucharist, in Hebrew means save us. So while it became a shout of praise to the Savior, originally it was a cry for help. And how were the people expecting their Savior to save them? Well, by conquering their enemies, driving out the Romans, going to the temple, cleaning up all that corruption taking over the rule himself, becoming like Caesar, only even more powerful, and most importantly, one of us. Fine to have an emperor as long as he's Jewish. But Jesus immediately begins to dash the hopes that are wrapped up in those fervent hosannas. He goes to the temple, but he doesn't proclaim the Father's kingdom. He doesn't install himself as the new king. He doesn't even remain in Jerusalem. He goes out to stay with friends in Bethany. And in the days that follow, Jesus will pronounce judgment after judgment, but it won't be on Rome and it won't be on the empire. Instead, it'll be on his own disciples, on his own city, on the temple. And there's a message in that. And the message is not Jesus was rejecting Judaism. The message, rather, is that what we most need to be saved from is generally not an enemy out there that we can all agree to hate, but the enemy within each of us, the enemy that can make the very ones celebrating salvation from oppression into oppressors themselves, bringing death to others. And we see that happening in our own day. Jesus, the blessed one who comes in the name of the Lord, comes to fulfill their hopes. But first he has to dash them so that they can turn to the hopes God has for them. Jesus will save his people, indeed all people, but not from their conquerors, not from, but from their desires to become conquerors themselves. He will save them not from their corrupt institutions, but from their own inner corruption that makes those institutions corrupt. He will redeem them, but not from the unfair taxes Rome has placed upon them. He will redeem them from the self-interest which demands that they preserve their lives instead of giving their lives. So what is it you to wave your palm branches and say, Hosanna, what do you need to be saved from? What are you willing to let go of and turn away from in order to follow this Jesus? Maybe that's the first question. Are you going to follow him? Or are you just going to let him keep going? Are you willing to keep following him after your palm branches dry up? which will happen in about six hours, <laughs> after you've tucked them behind a photo on the wall, are you going to jump from palms and hosannas this Sunday to Easter lilies and hallelujahs next Sunday? Or will you follow Jesus through everything that lies between? And I get it. Some Holy Week services are inconvenient. I mean, Thursday night, who wants to drive at night, right? And some services do make us uncomfortable. Good Friday, all that cross and death and sin, ugh. Although it is hard to make the cross upbeat. But that's the point. Jesus told us last week that if we're going to follow him, we have to take up our cross. And the cross was never meant to be convenient or comfortable. And so we gather to celebrate the Eucharist on the very night of the Last Supper because Jesus told us to do so in remembrance of him. And then we follow that by stripping the church of all of its richness and color, extinguishing the lights, because the light of God's mercy is a lot more when you've spent some time in the darkness. We need to wash feet on Monday, Thursday. And no, I don't love it either. <laughs> but we do it because it is humbling and uncomfortable and just like Peter, we have our own ideas of dignity that need to be challenged. And we need to venerate the cross on Friday precisely because it horrifies us. It should. We must begin Easter not 
in next Sunday's sunshine, but in the darkness of the days that come before it. Because as we said on Christmas morning, Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness. And the resurrection of Jesus is the ultimate sign that the darkness does not overcome it. But that means a lot more if you've spent some time in the darkness first. So today, Jesus rides not into Jerusalem, but into this temple, into our lives, to release us from the chains that enslave us. And for each of us, they will be different. The chains that keep us prisoners to fear, injustice, violence, and death itself, leading us in real triumph, not against an empire, but against the powers that work within us that keep us from living in the kingdom of God, that keep us trusting in all the other kingdoms of this world instead. So take your palm crosses home with you. Keep them where you will see them every day, but not as a superstitious talisman for protection and good luck, but as a reminder that people wave palms both to celebrate God's power and also the powers of this world. They wave them to welcome Jesus on his donkey, and they wave them to welcome the generals on their war horses. They laid them before those who took the life of their enemies and conquered their neighbors, and that's what brought peace. And they laid them before him who would give his own life to conquer everything that divides us from God and each other. So who do you wave your palm branches for today? Who will you trust to save you tomorrow? Who will you trust to lead you the next day and the next? Who will you trust and turn to when your days have come to an end? What power, whose power, will save you then? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and blessed are those who follow him.